Class Consciousness and Revolutionary Organization. This is a pamphlet from the Communist Workers Organization. It's posted to the ICT website. I'm going to read it in two parts. So this part is part one. So we'll be reading the intro and then chapter one to chapter five. And the second part will be chapter six to 10. So introduction. The issue of class consciousness is one of the most important for the working class and for its revolutionary minorities. Behind it lies the really big questions, such as how can capitalism be destroyed? And is the working class capable of creating a new society? Some, impatient to bring about the end of the system, which has plainly outlived its usefulness for the vast majority of humanity, have even despaired of the fight because they say the working class has been fought off or because capital's control of the media is so complete that workers can easily be fooled into accepting capitalist ideas. Others, like the various bordigist parties, argue that the only sense in which the proletariat actually exists as a class is if it forms a political party which is the sole expression of its revolutionary consciousness. Still others, and these seem to be a growing band today, believe the whole question of revolution will be posed without worrying about revolutionary consciousness at all. For them, revolution is basically a spontaneous issue which will arise directly from the daily economic struggle of the working class. It is our aim to address these and other questions here, but not as abstract philosophy. Our approach will be unashamedly historical and attempt to draw out the real experience of the working class in its struggles of the last two centuries. Communism is not just a theory or ideology, but the expression of the real movement of the working class in its fight against exploitation. This struggle is not a linear one, progressively homing in on an inevitable victory, but now advances, then retreats, as we have seen in the Paris Commune of 1871, and the Russian revolutions of 1905 and 1917. One thing though, it never completely vanishes for capitalism's contradictions constantly recreate the material conditions for the existence of a separate working class consciousness. In this historic, historical approach, we are in conformity with Marx who rejected speculation for a study of real life. When empty talk about consciousness ceases, and real knowledge has to take its place. When reality is depicted, philosophy as an independent branch of knowledge loses its, immediate, its medium of existence. Or to borrow from, <clears throat> Mark, from his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, our aim here is not merely to interpret the world, but to contribute to the revolutionary practice required to change it. In this sense, our short, pam our short pamphlet is only part of a work in progress, a contribution to debate and to the future struggle of our class. The pamphlet has its origins in a series of articles which appeared in revolutionary perspectives. For this reason, some arguments tend to be repeated, but we hope that this adds rather than detracts from its overall message. We would like to thank all the comrades who have sent in corrections for this reprint but we know that it is not by any means exhaustive and does not deal with questions like, for example, how a party comes to be organized inside the working class under present conditions. This is dealt with in our other publications, but it is a statement about where we think the class struggle has so far brought us on this long road to the freedom for not only the world working class, but through it for the whole of humanity itself. But before we can fully embark on that task, we need to first remind ourselves how the whole issue of consciousness arose. Chapter 1. Idealism and Bourgeois Materialism Consciousness in general. Ideas do not spring from thin air. The source of ideas or consciousness has occupied the ideologists of class society for thousands of years. For them, the great problem was the distinction between mind and matter between the animal bodies of human beings and their capacity for abstract thought. In ancient society, particularly in ancient Athens, philosophers like Plato saw ideas as being innate, only being brought, 
into the light of day by the articulation of thought. For him, the real world was the world of ideas, and the material world contained only shadows, or partial reflections of these ideas. The material world was thus a secondary world dependent on the world of ideas, and without the world of ideas, the material world would not exist at all. By studying the shadows and reflections in the secondary material world, the wise man can come to know the world of ideas or the real world. Consciousness of the real world is attainable only to the philosophers who can undertake this study. The rest of humanity is deceived by the world of shadows and consequently have false consciousness. It was no accident that such an idea was developed within a leisured class in a society where slaves did all the work and where labor was seen as something close to animal activity. These Greek aristocrats are the earliest of what we could call the idealists. For them, ideas have an existence independent of human activity and are the prime motive of all historical change. In some ways, this idealism was an advance on the later Christian philosophers of the feudal period, such as Thomas Aquinas. He reinterpreted Aristotle's worldview for the expanding Christian church. He placed the, Ju the Judeo-Christian God, rather than the one in Greek philosophy, as the fount of human consciousness. For the Christians, our thoughts belong to the soul which departed the animal body after death. Long before the advent of Christianity, humanity as a species that, as, that is aware came to explain that awareness by discovering something outside itself in religion. Religion throughout most of human history was a substitute for science, or as Marx put it in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, the gods in the beginning are not the cause, but the effect of man's intellectual confusion. Throughout the Middle Ages, authority rather than reason became the doctrine of the Christian church. Nature was external to human beings, alienated from them in philosophical terms, and this could not be fully understood by them as it was God-given. It was only under the impetus, the impetus of the scientific revolution which was predicated on the early development of capitalism, that this approach began to break down. The Copernican revolution overturned the biblical and Ptolemaic understanding of the cosmos. This in turn opened up the way for crude materialist philosophy. This took several forms from the rationalism of Descartes, who came up with ideas only using reason. He boasted he made his best leaps in knowledge in bed to the empiricism of Bacon, who had the merit of understanding that the world was the product of humanity's material existence. Bacon was the father of modern English empiricism in that he argued that what could not be proved by immediate experiment was unscientific. The same type of vulgar, vulgar materialism can be found in the works of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Locke, both in science and politics, upheld the rule of law. For him, scientists like Newton, who systematized whole branches of knowledge, like physics and mechanics, gave new laws to explain the order of the universe. For Locke, the English Glorious Revolution of 1688-89 to brought the same spirit of law and order to British society after the turbulence of the Civil War and Commonwealth. There was little room for the supernatural in either Newton's or Locke's view of the world a fact which brought them both criticism from the established church. Not surprisingly, this initial bourgeois materialism developed strongest in Britain, a country where capitalism and industrialism were already advancing rapidly. It was to remain so for a further century. Thus, the summit of 18th century science was materialism. This was certainly an advance since, since it established the fundamental basis of the materialist world outlook that all consciousness is derived from the material world and experience of this world. But whilst this materialism, oh no, I lost my place. But whilst this materialism was opposed to the spiritual subjectivism of religion, it could not seriously challenge it. This was due to several reasons which can only be dealt with schematically here. In the first place, the rising bourgeoisie tended to see human nature as a constant that had not changed throughout history. 
They equated the rise in science and reason to something that was inevitable, since they could not fully understand that it was the rise of a new mode of production dominated by themselves, which had helped to participate it, or to precipitate it. Similarly, they viewed human beings simply as disconnected atoms. Thus, they saw consciousness as being just about the individual as such, and not about the role of the individual in society. This was why they were fascinated by the story of Alexander Selkirk, who lived for years on a desert island, and which was immortalized in Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. All their works on economic behavior started from this very bourgeois figure, who, who even has a manservant miraculously provided to do the labor, as if it was an accurate explanation of how humanity had arrived at capitalism. Marx dismissed these fantasies as Robinsonades in his later writings. As to religion, the British could only throw up a skeptic like David Hume, who argued that modern science had shown that we could not be sure about anything. The conclusion was that there probably was a God, but as we could not communicate with him, then we should live life as though he did not exist. A major problem for the bourgeoisie was that religion had a social function. As Napoleon brutally put it in 1802, simple people need religion. How would the masses respect morality if it was not for restraints of religion? The French Revolution, when the people turned into the mob, drove the British bourgeoisie back to support for church and king against the godless French. The demands of social order decreed that science line up with the ruling class as expressed in Humphrey Davies' introductory discourse at the Royal Institution in 1802. The unequal division of property and of labor, the difference of rank and conditions amongst mankind, are the sources, sources of power in civilized life, its moving causes, and its very soul. A perfect illustration that there is no separating science from society. No wonder they bricked up the door to the public gallery so that rude mechanics could not get in to hear this clear endorsement of class society. But the same French Revolution, which led to the victory of Tory reaction in Britain, had the opposite effect in the German-speaking world. The defeat of idealism. In Germany, a series of over 360 separate feudal and semi-feudal states until Napoleon defeated the Prussians at Jena in 1806, idealist philosophy remained the dominant force in ruling class thinking. As Marx dubbed it, it was the German ideology and the dominant figure in this idealist world was G.W.F. Hegel. Hegel. Hegel was in many ways a contradictory thinker. Influenced by the drama of the French Revolution and even more directly by the Napoleonic conquests of Europe, Hegel himself witnessed the arrival of this world historic spirit in Jena. Hegel recognized that human history was not unchanging and that it had to be based on reality. What is he said, what is actual is necessary in itself. Necessity consists in this, that the whole is sundered into the different concepts, and that this divided whole yields a fixed and permanent determinacy. However, this is not fossilized determinacy, but one which permanently recreates itself in its dissolution. What Hegel gives us is a mechanism to understand change, the dialectic and even a recognition that this must be rooted in reality. For Hegel though, reality only became real when philosophers recognize it in what he called absolute spirit. This was, this was, an actu was actually a cover for God. Hegel's argument was that as man pursued his quest for understanding, he would logically arrive at the absolute or union with God. For Hegel, the purpose of reason was to understand the mind of God it had no concrete results. Philosophy is, in fact, in the service of God, is what he said. Or as he put it in another famous passage, philosophy comes too late to teach the world what it should be. The owl of Minerva only flies when dusk has fallen. But despite Hegel, ideas do have practical consequences. To argue that the purpose of thinking is merely to articulate what actually exists is to rationalize the status quo. Thus, he ended by arguing in post-Napoleonic Germany 
that the absolute ideal was the already existing Prussian state and church. In doing this, he not only did violence to his own ideas on historical change, but also split his followers. It was the debate on the legacy of Hegel which coincided with the development of capitalism and the bourgeoisie in Germany. And given the state of censorship at the period in which Metternich, the Austrian chancellor, crushed all liberal and national movements in German-speaking lands through the German Bund formed in 1815. The debate was fought out in the obscure language of philosophy. Most of Hegel's critical followers, the young Hegelians, were rooted out of the Prussian universities after the ascension of Frederick William IV in 1840. This included Marx's own mentor, Brunner Bauer, and thus Marx himself. Marx now turned away from the academic life to journalism. As a contributor and later editor of the, oh man, bear with me now, Rheinische Zeitung, after 1841, Marx admitted that it was an important step on the road to his acceptance of communist ideas and what we now call historical materialism. I experienced for the first time the embarrassment of having to take part in discussions on so-called material interests. <clears throat> first, though, he had to settle accounts with his philosophical past, his experience of the conditions of the working class, as seen in his article on the debate on the law on the thefts of timber in October 1842, itself sharpened his attack not only on Hegel, but also on his followers. This was not something that occurred overnight. Marx was never content with the superficial, hence why after nearly s several decades of gestation, his project for capital was, not, was never completed. He had read Hegel very carefully and had initially tried to reject Hegel's thinking altogether. But after intense study, he had succumbed to the powerful dialectical method Hegel employed. However, when he too realized the implications of Hegel's ideas, he joined the young Hegelians who were beginning to criticize the master's thinking. Marx, however, saw consciousness only as an individual phenomenon. Oh. Oh, that's not right. Marx, however, we know that's not right. Marx, however, soon began to diverge from them too, since they accepted Hegel's idealist conception of the dominance of ideas over reality. When Ludwig Feuerbach, in his preliminary theses for the reform of philosophy, criticized Hegel's method as a mystification and put real flesh and blood human beings rather than God at the center of philosophy, Marx enthusiastically greeted his work. However, even Feuerbach's materialism did not fully satisfy Marx's own developing views. In 1843, Marx was not yet a communist and was collaborating with Arnold Rouge on the Dutch Franz oh, fuck. Franzosisch Jarbucker. <laughs> Marx's second contribution to this was his introduction to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. He starts this article by announcing once again the debt of German philosophers to Feuerbach. For Germany, the criticism of religion has been essentially completed, and criticism of religion is the premise of all criticism. But then he goes on to say that religion does not arise as a false consciousness, as Feuerbach has it. Religion arises because of the ways in which human beings have hitherto organized their social and political existence. The basis of irreligious criticism is, man makes religion. Religion does not make man. But man is not an abstract being squatting outside the world. Man is the world of man, the state, society. This state and this society produce religion, which is an inverted consciousness of the world, because they are an inverted world. Religion offered thus both a justification of the existing order and a source of consolation and rejection of it. The famous passage on it being the opium of the people is often merely interpreted as a statement of atheism, but it went much deeper and was also an expression of the materialist basis of Marxism. The struggle against religion is therefore indirectly the struggle against the world, whose spiritual aroma is religion. Religious suffering is the expression of real suffering and at the same time, 
the protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, as it is the spirit of spiritless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The criticism of religion is thus in embryo, a criticism of the veil of tears, whose halo is religion. Marx did not write much more on religion after this. Another job left for Engels. The reason is clear, with the pronouncement in the same work that religion is only the illusory sun that revolves around man so long as he does not revolve about himself. Marx could not concentrate on what was the real issue of how human beings achieve their emancipation. Marx could not fall into the trap of the young Hegelians by simply insisting that the world would change because their idealism was more rational than Hegel's. Marx criticized this view in yet another letter to Rouge. We do not then set ourselves opposite the world with a doctrinaire principle, saying here's the truth, kneel down here. It is out of the world's own principles that we develop for it new principles. We do not say to her, stop your battles, they are stupid stuff. We want to preach the true slogans of battle at you. We merely show it what it is actually fighting about, and this realization is a thing it must make its, its own even though it may not wish to. The reform of consciousness consists solely in letting the world perceive its own consciousness, by awaking it from dreaming about itself and explaining to it its own actions. This is an essential, essential element of Marx's views of the interrelationship of ideas and activity. They were both the product of human history. In the preface to the German ideology, Marx and Engels basically take the piss out of the young Hegelian's idealistic method. Hitherto, men have constantly made up for themselves false conceptions about themselves, about what they are and what they ought to be. They have arranged their ideas about the relationships according to their ideas of God, of normal man, etc. The phantoms of their brains have got out of their heads. They, the creators, have bowed down before the creations. Let us liberate them from the chimeras, the ideas, dogmas, imaginary beings under the yoke of which they are pining away. Let us revolt against the rule of thoughts. Let us teach men, says one, to exchange these imaginations for thoughts which correspond to the essence of man, says the second, to take up the critical attitude to them, say the third, to knock them out of their heads and existing reality will collapse. Just in case anyone is doubting this is irony, Marx and Engels tell us that these are the innocent and childlike fancies of the young Hegelians. They hammer the point about their idealism home with a further piece of satire. Once upon a time, a valiant fellow had the idea that men were drowned in water only because they were possessed of the idea of gravity. If they were to knock this notion out of their heads, say by stating it to be a superstition, a religious concept, they would be sublimely proof against any danger from water. His whole life long, he fought against the illusion of gravity of whose harmful results all statistics brought him new and manifold evidence. This honest fellow was the type of the new revolutionary philosophers in Germany. By now, Marx had a problem. How could Germany, which had a developed philosophy, but a backward social structure, participate in the emancipation of humanity? The weapon of criticism obviously cannot replace the criticism of weapons. Material force must be overthrown by material force. But theory also becomes material force when it grips the masses. But in Germany, by contrast, where practical life is as mindless as mental life is impractical, no class in civil society has any need or capacity for general emancipation until it is forced to to by its immediate condition, by material ne necessity, by its very chains. It only needed Marx to link together his theoretical evolution with his experience in dealing with material questions on the Rheinisch Zeitung to discover that the class he was talking about was the working class, the proletariat. The only possibility for real emancipation lay in the formations of a class 
with radical chains, a class in civil society that is not of civil society, a class that is the dissolution of all classes, a sphere of society having universal character because of its universal suffering, a sphere, in short, that is the complete loss of humanity and can only redeem itself through the total redemp redemption of humanity. The dissolution of society as a particular class is the proletariat. It is no accident that Marx was to be the theoretical leader of communism, but he became so not just from his own quest to understand how human society had changed and would change over time. It was also due to the incipient rise of the proletariat at that time. Marx moved towards communism after he had gone to Paris and made contact with workers and the early French socialists in October 1843. Marxism as a method thus arose as a reflection of the growth of capitalism in Europe. The proletariat were identified as the really revolutionary class, not as a sentimental whim, and even less because they were a simple Hegelian ideal antithesis, but because the proletariat above all was the one class of flesh and blood, mortals, which represented the very opposite of, of private property. And in recognizing the potential of the working class, Marx also gave to the proletariat the scientific basis for its own emancipation. Historical materialism. In the light of the above, Marx made it clear that their worldview was exactly the opposite of the idealism of Hegelianism. In an afterword to the second German edition of Capital in 1873, Marx explained that Hegel's exposition of the dialectic was, standing on its head, it must be turned right side up again if you would discover the rational kernel within the mystical shell. He went on to explain how his materialism was the direct opposite of Hegel's idealism. My dialectic method is not only different from the Hegelian, but it is direct opposite. To Hegel, the life process of the human brain, i.e. the process of thinking, which under the name of the idea, he even transforms into an independent subject is the demiurgos of the real world, and the real world is only the external, phenomenal form of the idea. With me, on the contrary, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected by the human mind and translated into forms of thought. But long before this, he had set out his historical materialist ideas more positively. The German ideology thus begins, the premises from which we begin are not arbitrary ones, not dogmas, but real premises from which abstraction can be made only in the imagination. They are the real individuals, their activity and the material conditions under which they live, both those which they find already existing and those produced by their activity. These premises can thus be verified in a purely empirical way. This is why Marxism can never be compared to a religion Religion requires only faith and its premises are unchallengeable. But every statement of Marxism has to be verified in the real world. And this real world is dominated by human beings need to solve the basic problems of existence. <coughs> the first premise of all human history is of course the existence of living human being, human individuals. They can be distinguished from animals by consciousness by religion or anything else you like. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence. This and the famous passage in the preface to the introduction to the critique of political economy are the basic statements of historical materialism. However, they are only basic. However, they are only basic. Marx carries on the discussion to point out that the reproduction of material life is not just a mechanical process, as the Stalinists were to maintain in the 1930s. It is also the real life of these individuals and is historically conditioned by time and place. The way in which men produce their means of subsistence depends, first of all, on the nature of the actual means of subsistence they find in existence and have to reprodu reproduce. This mode of production must not be considered simply as being the production of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, it is a definite form of the activity of these individuals, a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. 
And this is not all. In contrast, the Feuerbach and other bourgeois materialists who saw consciousness as an individual phenomenon resulting from the impact of sense perception, physical and even metabolic factors, e.g. diet, on the isolated human being, Marx saw that variations in consciousness were due to their activity as human beings collectively in a society. The production of life, both of one's own in labor and of fresh life in procreation, now appears as a double relationship, on the one hand as natural, on the other as a social relationship. By social we understand the cooperation of several individuals, no matter under what conditions, in what manner, and to what end. It follows from this that a certain mode of production or industrial stage is always combined with a certain mode of cooperation or social stage, and this mode of cooperation is itself a productive force. Again, this is one of the main criticisms of Feuerbach's materialism. The highest point attained by contemplative materialism, that is, materialism that does not understand sensuousness as practical activity, is the contemplation of single individuals in civil society. Consciousness would not only vary historically, but also through social relations and class position. Consciousness is thus not derived from the world individually, as in bourgeois materialism, but is a social and collective product. The sum total of these relations of production constitute economic structure of society, the real foundation, to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but their social being which determines their consciousness. Finally, in establishing the differences between historical materialism and bourgeois materialism, Marxist materialism is dialectical, whereas bourgeois materialists saw individual human beings as passively receiving sensory imprints, which were then physiologically translated into consciousness. Marx argued that this was a vulgar materialism. <clears throat> In reality, the raw material of experience is actively restructured by its recipients through thought, and since thought has a historical dimension, it also acts as part of the process of the development of consciousness, and they in turn react back on their experience. Consciousness is not a direct product of experience, but an indirect one. Consciousness is structured by and mediated by already existing patterns of understanding and thought. This is the meaning of the first of the theses on Feuerbach. The chief defect of all previous materialism, including that of Feuerbach, is that things, gegenstand, reality, the sensible world, are conceived only in the form of the objects of observation, but not as human sense activity, not as practical activity. Consciousness, therefore, has to have a social and a historical dimension. It was to underline this interrelation of thought and practice at this point that Marx later adds the famous thesis that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in different ways. The point is to change it. But changing the world is the key to the issue. Marx's critique of German philosophy as ideology, in this sense just speculation about human history, was worthless unless he could explain how the process of change could come about. In order to distance himself from the idealists, Marx made it clear that communism wasn't just a sentiment, some sentimentally pleasant idea, nor was it dreamed up in his head. Communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established, to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. However, materialism seemed to have erected a barrier to its own conclusions. The premises might have existed, but where was the material movement? A few pages later, Marx seems to offer no hope of proletarian emancipation at all. The ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas, i.e. the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. 
The class which has the means of material production at its disposal has control at the same time over the means of mental production, so that thereby, generally speaking, the ideas of those who lack the means of mental production are subject to it. The truth of this the truth of this statement is all too obvious in our own time, where a handful of media magnates faithfully produce PAP for the defense of their class interests on a daily basis. But if this is the case, how can communism become the real movement in any shape or form? The answer given by Marxism and the proletariat will be examined in the next chapter. How, or chapter two, how working class consciousness develops. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture with traditional property relations. No wonder that its development involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. At the end of the first chapter, we left readers with an apparent contradiction in Marx's views on consciousness. Whilst in Marx, on the one hand, could declare in the provisional rules of the first international that the emancipation of the working class must be conquered by the working classes themselves. He had earlier seemed to offer no hope of proletarian emancipation at all. The ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas, i.e. the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time as ruling intellectual force. It is generally true that in all class societies the ideas of the ruling class dominate and yet society changes and the ruling classes are overthrown. How does this occur? The development of bourgeois class consciousness. While the ideas of the ruling class are generally the ruling ideas in society, it is obvious that their domination can never be total. The material reality of class society with its inherent conflicts and insoluble contradictions is continually generating the basis for ideas which oppose those of the ruling class. It is not classes as such which challenge the received ideology, but the struggle between them that generates, at certain points in history, the ideas of both the exploited and the exploiting class. Let's start with our current class enemy. How did the bourgeoisie begin its rise to domination under feudalism? The bourgeoisie began life as mere supplicants under feudalism. Monarchs and local aristocrats gave them charters with rights to set up markets and to produce outside the system of serfdom because they provided goods and services which the feudal military system could not. They themselves accepted restrictions on trade via the guilds in order to protect their own wealth. But when that wealth had reached such a proportion that it dwarfed the, the aristocracy's landed wealth, they began to, to demand more. They demanded an end to feudal restrictions on the growth of their wealth, internal customs duties, tax immunity for the aristocracy, etc. When feudal society responded by refusing to honor their contribution to the state because of their low birth, then the bourgeoisie unfurled the ideological banner of freedom and became the standard bearer of the anti-feudal forces in the third estate. The bourgeoisie didn't say that their liberty was only liberty for the property owner. They didn't say only those who actually owned a bit of the country's wealth could be citizens. Freedom for them meant freedom of trade, freedom to exploit labor unlimitedly, and freedom to control the press so that ultimately, once the bourgeoisie had fully got its hands on the levers of state power, it could even concede universal suffrage confident in the knowledge that it was no threat to their property interests. The proletariat which did its share of fighting and dying in the struggle against feudalism was now told that freedom had been won and there was no need for any further struggle. But what was the end of history for our bourgeoisie was only the beginning for the proletariat. Right up to the present day, the material reality of capitalist society, however the bourgeoisie, consciously or not, attempt to hide it. Conflicts with the capitalist ideology they propound. While we are told of capitalism's wonderful virtues, such as efficiency, such as efficiency, 
justice, harmony with human nature, and so forth, the proletariat experiences unemployment, deprivation, exploitation, and war. This creates the basis for ideas which begin to challenge capitalist ideology. At first, these ideas are only concerned with the self-definition of the proletariat as a class. As Marx put it in the Communist Manifesto, but with the development of industry, the proletariat not only increases in number, it becomes concentrated in greater masses. Its strength grows and it feels that strength more. The collisions between individual workmen and individual bourgeois take more and more the character of collisions between two classes. Thereupon the, thereupon the workers begin to form combinations, trades unions against the bourgeois. They club together in order to keep up the rate of wages. They found permanent associations in order to make provision beforehand for these occasional revolts. Here and there, the conflict breaks out into riots. From class in itself to class for itself. But this is only workers defining themselves as a social entity, as a class. This is what Marx called the class in itself. It is not yet a class acting as fully conscious of how it can really achieve its own emancipation. He made this clear in Wages, Price, and Profit, written in 1865. Here, he first argued that workers had to fight to exist as a class. If they didn't, they would be degraded to one level, massive broken wretches past salvation. At the same time, although he later told German trade, trades union leaders that trades unions are schools of socialism, he made it clear that they were conservative in nature and that it was in becoming socialists that workers took on the real class viewpoint. He went on to warn that the working class ought not to exaggerate to themselves the ultimate working of these everyday struggles. They ought not to forget that they are fighting with effects, but not with causes of those effects, that they are ret retarding the downward movement, but not changing its direction, that they are ap applying palliatives, but not curing the malady, they ought, therefore, not to be exclusively absorbed in these unavoidable guerrilla fights incessantly springing up from the never-ceasing encroachments of capital or changes in the market. They ought to understand that, with all the miseries it imposes upon them, the present system simultaneously engenders the material conditions and the social forms necessary for an economical reconstruction of society. Instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, they ought to inscribe on their banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wages system. In other words, they have to become a class for itself. This means a class which is not only a social category resisting capitalism, but recognizes programmatically what it has to do to in, do to in order to replace capitalism with a society built in its own image. Here we should pause a minute just to clarify our categories. Obviously, class consciousness can refer to a whole range of attitudes and ideas. In real life, these cannot be simply categorized into straightforward stages through which a class progressively passes in linear fashion. Real life is obviously a lot messier than any scientific attempt to make sense of it. However, it is clear that there is world of difference between a strike against an attempt to lower wages and a mass struggle which calls for the overthrow of a ruling state or a ruling caste, sorry. They are two fundamentally different propositions. In this chapter, we have defined the everyday economic struggle as the expression of class instinct. Without it, there would be no class consciousness of any kind. The struggle which articulates the proletariat's path to emancipation, however, we have called class consciousness in its fullest sense, i.e. communist consciousness. However, as we argued in the first part of this chapter, the acquisition of this level of class consciousness, which goes beyond mere recognition of class identity, is not something that happens directly or automatically. If that were the case, the mystery would be why the revolution had not happened years ago. And of course, the academic defenders of the capitalist order frequently resort to this argument when trying to scoff at the idea of the class struggle, the historic role of the proletariat, or historical materialism. 
This kind of class consciousness was not automatically acquired by the bourgeoisie either. They started out by simply defending the particular form of property they owned against the feudal constraints on their social advance. If, as in Great Britain, the the er, 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 fuck the aristocrats <laughs> led the merchants or let the merchants enjoy similar social status and intermarried with them, then the bourgeoisie took over the state via a long process, which was not without its bloodshed. Think only of the English Civil War and the execution of Charles I. When, on the other hand, the, the aristocracy tried to keep or return the bourgeoisie to their former subservient status, then the bourgeoisie began to clothe themselves in the rationale of the Enlightenment. Liberty, fraternity, equality are fine phrases for mobilizing society against the old order. But once victory was won, the proletariat and the other dominated classes in capitalist society found that these ideas had only limited application. Equality meant only equality before the law, which means that those who can afford it get more justice than those who cannot. But this limited notion of freedom leads in part to the formation of the proletariat's own alternative. The bourgeoisie, therefore, did not merely arrive at social and political domination through following their class instincts. They also had to articulate their own program of the world they would like to build in their own image. 19th century liberalism became the bourgeois ideology, the real expression of its full class consciousness. Little wonder those bourgeois today who hanker to recover that lost world have adopted neoliberalism as the decadent version of their old ideology. For the proletariat, the situation is different and in one sense, more difficult. The proletariat is not trying to defend a particular form of property. It is the negation of private property. This not only explains why it is the only class truly capable of emancipating all humanity, but also why it arrives at its form of class consciousness in a radically different way. It cannot build up its power base in the old society through first creating economic forms of domination and then fighting for political power, as the bourgeoisie did. The proletariat cannot free itself without abolishing the conditions of its own life. This means that the proletariat must fight for political power first, as it says in the Communist Manifesto. The first step in the revolution by the working class must be to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class. Its class consciousness thus has ultimately to take a political dimension. However, this political dimension can only arise from the actual experience of the proletarian movement in a struggle in which it forges first its identity, then its purpose. Not in vain does it go through the stern but stealing school of labor. The question is not what this or that proletarian, or even the whole of the proletariat at the moment, considers as its aim. The question is what the proletariat is, and what, consequent on that being, it will be compelled to do. Party and Class Consciousness In general, under normal conditions of capitalist domination, the class struggle takes the form of the guerrilla struggles here or there against the effects of capitalism. This often leads workers in one place to become more militant than workers in another and leads them to begin to question the existing order. This means that class consciousness, i.e. the idea that capitalism has to be overthrown and replaced by communism, can only be achieved by a minority and one that is scattered throughout the class. Here, we must not get caught up in the post-Russian revolution debate about who belongs to this minority. We will deal with that later, but Marx was clear that it was a political movement. Just as the economists are the scientific representatives of the bourgeois class, so the socialists and communists are the theoreticians of the proletarian class. These theoreticians, though, are at first utopians who go in search of a regenerating science. What transforms them into revolutionaries is the actual revolutionary movement of the working class. But in the measure that history moves forward and with it the struggle of the proletariat assumes clearer outlines, they no longer need to seek science in their minds. They only have to take note of what is happening before their eyes and to become its mouthpiece. From this moment, science, which is the product of the historical movement, has associated itself consciously with it 
has ceased to be doctrinaire and has become revolutionary. In other words, socialist or communist ideas can only gain wider acceptance in periods of acute social crisis, when capitalism's contradictions erupt in a direct way, leading to massive struggles of the working class. A significant minority will only achieve communist consciousness through a whole series of battles and partial defeats in which the issues are ever more clearly posed. The practical struggle and comprehension of the str that struggle is what can produce a changed consciousness, as Marx wrote. The coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity or self-changing can be conceived and rationally understood only as revolutionary practice. The practical movement of revolution is the only force able to challenge the ideas of the bourgeoisie on a mass scale and produce wider communist or class consciousness, both for the, pro for the production on a mass scale of this communist consciousness and for the success of the cause itself, the alteration of human beings on a mass scale is necessary. An alteration which can only take place in a practical movement, a revolution. This revolution is necessary, therefore, not only because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only, in a revolution, succeed in ridding itself of all the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew. In other words, before revolution breaks out, communist consciousness is only attained by a minority of the class. It is the act of revolution which turns this into the necessary mass consciousness of the class. Necessary because communism cannot be built by a minority. Because it is a totally new system of production, it has to be the work of the mass of the class since it is their self-activity which distinguishes the communist mode of production from all previous modes of production. However, this still hasn't fully answered the question posed at the beginning, nor does it explain how the scattered experience of the working class can be drawn together to prepare for a time when revolution is on the agenda. Marx did not shirk this one. For him, the organization of the proletariat into a class and consequently into a political party is entirely logical. How else would those who had already arrived at an understanding that the, wo the whole thrust of the proletariat's struggle led in the direction of communism, organize themselves and fight to extend those ideas to other workers. At this point too, Marx has no hang-ups about class origins of communists. Just as therefore at an earlier period, a section of the nobility went over to the bourgeoisie, so now a portion of the bourgeoisie goes over to the proletariat, and in particular a portion of the bourgeois ideologists who have raised themselves to the level of comprehending theoretically the historical movement as a whole. This is, of course, before the negative experience of the Bolshevik party in the Russian Revolution had solely the very idea of a proletarian party. Thus, to return to the quote at the top of this text, when Marx wrote that the emancipation of the working class must be conquered by the working classes themselves, he wasn't lining up with future councilists against future vanguardists. This quotation itself comes from the rules for the establishment of the first international, the first attempt at an international party of the working class. What he was arguing here was that the proletariat had to form their own political party, which was not under the influence of this or that bourgeois faction. He was particularly aiming at English trades unionists who still maintained support for the Liberal Party of Gladstone. It was the task of this political party to continually make sense of the workers' own struggles and to cast them back into those struggles in the form of a program of total emancipation, or as we would say, a communist program. As Marx had earlier argued, ideas themselves became a material force when they were joined to the actual ongoing struggle of the class. This is why Marx and Engels made several attempts to form political organizations which raised the banner of communism, from the Communist League in 1848 to the First International in 1864 and the German Social Democratic Party in 1875. That they encouraged all three but ultimately found them all unsatisfactory was not a testimony to their fickleness, but to the, 
to the underdeveloped nature of the class movement in the 19th century. Whilst it was one thing to identify the general philosophical framework in which the changing of ideas and conditions can be brought about, the real movement had to be tested out in the crucible of working class experience. It is to this we turn in chapter three. Chapter three, Marx Engels and Proletarian Organization. In the previous chapter, we demonstrated that the notion of a political organization of the working class is not an artificial construct, but arises from the very class nature of the proletariat. The working class does not have a property system to defend. It cannot therefore extend its consciousness simply by defending its immediate material interests. Its consciousness is formed in its struggle, and this, by the nature of the struggle, is often partial, fragmentary, and episodic. It rises in one area as it falls in another. The economic struggle against capital, though, leads to some workers reflecting and acting on their experience in different ways. Those who recognize that the struggle for wages is not the real outcome, but that the struggle to end the wages system is, are forced to systematically organize around a program which contains the lessons of the proletariat's experience up to that point. This poses the question of a political organization and in the terms of the 19th century, this meant a political party. The term party had its origins in an insult made by the rising bourgeoisie <clears throat> against those who supported one aristocratic gang against another. A man of party was by definition anti-patriotic but the bourgeoisie were not averse to organizing themselves into parties. Originally in the French Revolution, all the leading political elements joined the same club, but as the question of what to replace the old order with, its different bourgeois interests, especially once the vulgar mob started to take part in proceedings, then this club, nicknamed the Jacobins, fractured, and the constitutional monarchists, the Feuillants, and Republican rich, Girondins split from the more petty bourgeois Parisian based Jacobins. Even these were not parties in the sense we would understand today since they had only a vague ideology and the Jacobins were split into factions like the Robespierreists and the so-called Indulgence or Dantonists. It was only with the setting up of voting systems originally with restricted fran franchises that we get the bourgeois party as a vote gathering machine proper, which developed in the period 1815 to 70. Does this, does this mean that we have to agree with Otto Rule that all parties are bourgeois? His conclusion was based on his experience, not only of how the Bolshevik party became the instrument of counter revolution in Russia, but even more on his longer experience of the, of the political conditions inside German social democracy. It is the problems which arise in the period of social democracy. The first arises when workers are really organized into political parties as such that we have to look to understand some of the issues which, which confront us today. However, before we get to this point, we cannot ignore the actual experience of the working class in the lifetime of Marx and Engels. It might seem useless to refer to them for an answer to the present day issues about how proletarian class consciousness achieves an organized form, but it is equally inaccurate to argue that they were indifferent to the issue of a political organization. This is clear even before the famous manifesto of the Communist Party of 1848. The year before, in the poverty of philosophy, Marx laid out the basic path to, to class consciousness of the modern proletariat. Taking the English proletariat as his material example, he noted that in the first aim of resistance was merely the maintenance of wages, combinations at first isolated, constitute themselves into groups as the capitalists unite for the purpose of repression and in the face of always united capital, the maintenance of the association becomes more necessary to them than that of wages. In this struggle, a veritable civil war, all the elements necessary for a coming political battle, unite and develop. Once it has reached this point, association takes on a political character. 
economic conditions had at first transformed the mass of people of the country into workers. The combination of capital is created for this mass a common situation, common interests. This mass is already a class as against capital, but not yet for itself. In the struggle of which we have noted only a few phases, this mass becomes united and constitutes itself as a class for itself. The interests it defends becomes class interests. But the struggle of class against class is a political struggle. But if class struggle ultimately was political struggle, what was the vehicle for this struggle? Workers did not wait long for an answer. In the manifesto of the Communist Party, Marx announced to the world that it is high time that communists should openly, in the face of the whole world, publish their views, their aims, their tendencies, and meet this nursery tale of the specter of communism with a manifesto of the party itself. It should be noted that the word party at this point has no capital letter. Marx is talking of a trend, not an actual body. Although the Communist League, which sponsored the manifesto, was real, en real enough, it did not have any exaggerated view that it was already a real force. But in the manifesto, Marx makes it quite clear that class for itself means the formation of a political party. When discussing the class struggle between capital and labor, he states that the real fruit of their battle lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever expanding union, here meaning unification, not trades union, of the workers. Once again, however, every class struggle is a political struggle. So the result is the organization of the proletariat into a class and consequently into a political party. Of course, of course, in 1848, no such party actually existed, and the statements about that party and its relation to the working class have to be taken as propagandist rather than definitive. However, this did not stop Marx and Engels from trying to develop the Communist League from its semi-Jacobin origins into a real organization of the working class. To this end, they sought the widest possible appeal. Thus, they wrote that the Communists do not form a separate party opposed to other working class parties. The Communists are the most advanced and resolute sections of the working class parties of every country. The fact that they had only the vaguest outlines of what a proletarian party would have to look like at this early point in working class history does not invalidate the view that they saw the need for the most advanced proletarians to maintain a permanent political association. Otherwise, why would it be necessary to assert that the communists have over the great mass of the proletariat that advantage of clearly understanding the line of march? Marx and Engels underlined the need for political clarity in the third part of the manifesto, where they subject all the trends that had up until that time claimed to represent the working class to critical scrutiny. St. Simon, Owen, Proudhon, Cabet, Fourier, etc. are all put under the magnifying glass of withering criticism and dismissed. <clears throat> The idea that the communists do not set themselves up in opposition to other working class parties did not mean, even at this early stage, that anyone calling themselves socialist was accepted as such. In a sense, it is a taste of the political debates ahead as the proletariat tries to define itself against capital and develops a materialist worldview, which uh, went beyond paternalism and utopianism. The manifesto recognized quite clearly the twin themes at the heart of the development of working class consciousness. It recognized that communism was an entirely different mode of production, which could only come about when that communist consciousness had spread to a majority of the workers. All previous historical movements were movements of minorities or in the interests of minorities. The proletarian movement is the self-conscious, independent movement of the immense majority. But it, is, but it also underlined the role of the communists as the only fully conscious members of the proletariat. They were the ones who understood the line of march of the whole proletariat. They represented the future. They represented the future that all proletarians would eventually have to attain if capitalism were to be overthrown. 
This, of course, begged a few questions about precisely at what stage the consciousness of communism would spread to the wider class movement. But this was a question which was only clearly posed later during the period of social democracy at the turn of the century. In the 1840s and 1850s, Marx and Engels were more interested in the development of the class movement as a whole, as it was still in its infancy. They had participated in and even led the Communist League, but when they saw that the possibility of proletarian revolution would have to be postponed to the distant future, <clears throat> they had no hesitation in breaking with those in the League who thought that the next revolution was near and would be proletarian. However, although they split with the willick Schapper group in the Communist League in 1850, they did not simply retire to the study. Both maintained a continuous correspondence with all the elements in Germany and elsewhere who would one day contribute to a new proletarian organization. Even Schapper was, rec was reconciled to Marx within a few years when it was clear that Marx's perspective on revolution was right. It is also a bit of a myth that capital was written in isolation from the debates within the working class during this period. What Marx and Engels did try to avoid was the, pretty, the petty squabbles of the various small groups that did appear in this period. They did not attack people like LaSalle too strongly despite his rejection of economic struggles, thus turning the struggle for socialism into something religious rather than based on what was really going on despite his offers to do deals with the Prussian state. Thus, until the foundation of the First International in 1864, they virtually kept themselves silent during all the political infighting between the various tendencies in the international proletarian movement. The First International. The contacts Marx and Engels maintained were to be absolutely central to their rise to dominance over the First International after 1864. However, their involvement in this body was initially almost an accident. The International Working Men's Association arose out of the narrow desire of English trades unionists to prevent French workers breaking English strikes and the Emperor Francis desire to demonstrate his paternal regard for his workers by subsidizing a delegation to visit the London International Exhibition in 1862. This delegation of French workers, mainly followers of Proudhon, took part in a conference with the English trades unionists and agreed to set up an international working men's association. Also invited to the first meeting were delegations from foreign workers living in London, including those who supported bourgeois nationalists like the Mazinians as well as French Republicans. Marx was eventually invited to write its main documents, the inaugural address and the provisional rules, and realized he would have to be very skillful to keep this disparate alliance together, especially as the English were hostile to the very idea of politics being brought into the organization. These documents are thus no ringing declaration of the principles of scientific, of scientific communism like the Communist Manifesto was. Marx himself wrote of the need for a gentle style. Marx tried to direct the participants away from trades union demands or demand issues to the greater political issues. This is why he includes the line, to conquer politic political power has therefore become the great duty of the working classes. This may be self-evident today, but it was intended to set down a benchmark to make the English trades unionists in the international widen their perspectives. He also skillfully praised the internationalist actions of the English working class in the face of such issues as fighting slavery in the US Civil War, where they had come out against the South despite the fact that the loss of cotton from its slave plantations cost them jobs. Marx hoped that the aristocracy of labor represented in the English new model unions of the time would take on the task of organizing the whole working class, but their particularist trade mentality disappointed him. After 1867, the Reform Act led many trades union unionists to throw in their lot with a liberal party, precisely what Marx hoped to avoid when he wrote the draft rules. William Kremer, 
General Secretary of the International, eventually became a Liberal MP. In the previous chapter, we looked at how Marx and Engels theoretically understood the limitations of trades unions, activity, and the economic struggle. But during the course of the first international, they came to recognize that the trade union movement among all the big, strong, and rich trade unions has become more an obstacle to the general movement than an instrument for its progress. It was also against the English trades unionists, as well as the French Proudhonists, that Marx wrote the line that has been quoted out of context by the worshippers of spontaneity ever since. That the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves. This was an argument for a party and for political action. It was aimed at those who argued that the aim of the International Working Men's Association was just to defend workers' living conditions and against those who looked to bourgeois parties to help them. Proletarian autonomy meant having their own political instrument that was based on their consciousness and their program. However, at the beginning, Marx's subtleties were too much for the English trades unionists who were satisfied with his address and his rules. So Marx now had a base of support within the international with which to deal with the French Proudhonists. At this point, Marx and Engels were highly optimistic about the future of the international. On September 11th, 1867, Marx could write to Engels. At the next Congress, I shall personally deliver a knockout blow to these Proudhonist jackasses. I have managed the whole thing diplomatically and did not want to come out personally until my book, Capital, was published and our association had struck root. The scoundrels among the English trades unionists who thought we went too far now come running to us. Things are moving and in the next revolution, which is perhaps nearer than it appears, we, i.e. you and I, will have this powerful engine in our hands. The End of the International Although the prediction about the future revolution took the material form of the Paris Commune in 1871, the optimism about how the international itself might act was unfounded. Whilst the Paris Commune was to further develop the working class understanding of its revolutionary tasks, the need to smash the old bourgeois state, etc., the international had little organizational impact since Paris was the centre of the Proudhon faction in the international. Although the Proudhonists were no longer dominant in the international, they still represented a considerable force in France, where, where artisanal and petty bourgeois production was still widespread. Thus, Proudhonist mutualist schemes had a certain resonance, but in no way conflicted with the basic operation of the capitalist mode of production. Proudhon's oft-quoted line, property is theft, sounds good, but he himself argued for petty bourgeois property and thought that equal labor exchanges were possible. He also argued that women did not enter into this concept of equal labor exchange since their proper place was the home, a view naturally accepted by the English trades unionists. By 1868, the Proudhonists were all but defeated inside the General Council of the International, but the looming threat then came from the anarchist prince, Michael Bakunin. This is not the place to analyze all the extraordinary acts of Bakunin, but the struggle against his maneuvers to create an anarchist international within the international also emphasized the tension between the need to have the broadest possible appeal to workers, whilst at the same time having a sufficiency of agreement on both a political and organizational level to make an international proletarian party, which was capable of acting decisively. In the end, the whole Bakunist, Bakuninist, episode simply helped write the obituary of the international. By the time the first international was in its death throes, it was recognized that there was a need for an international which was much more programmatically coherent and organizationally centralized. In the course of the history of the international, therefore, the proletariat learned one lesson, which was that those who professed adherence to the proletariat did not necessarily understand how to fight capitalism. The political organization of the class was beginning to take shape as the collective memory of the working class. It alone reflected on the class experience and programmatically carried them forward into the next period in history. Marx and Engels themselves had come a long way from the fairly vague statement of the Communist Manifesto. 
Now they saw the need for an organization of the wider working class, which understood revolutionary praxis. Towards the end of the life of the International, particularly after the Paris Commune, Marx had recognized that the International needed deeper roots inside the life of the working class of countries throughout the world in order to have real influence on events. This ushered in the phase which led up to the formation of social democracy and the Second International in 1889. This was to bring new problems and new insights on the, de on the development of revolutionary organization. It is to these that we turn in the next chapter. Chapter four, the era of social democracy and the fight against revisionism. Lessons of the First International. As we have argued in the last chapter, the struggle for proletarian self-emancipation presupposed the existence of a political organization, a political party. This was something Marx and Engels had understood as early as the Communist Manifesto. Even during the long period of class quiet in the so-called golden years of capitalism, 1850 to 70, they maintained contact with other revolutionaries to, to prepare the time when a new organization would once again be on the agenda. Thus, in 1864, they had no hesitation in taking part in the formation of the First International. Despite the trades union and Prudhana's prejudices of most of its founders, what the history of the First International showed was that the proletariat could not reach freedom with just any old organization. The debates and splits inside the First International proved that it not only had to have a clearer program which excluded class collaborationist ideas inherited from Proudhon and the English trades unionists, but it also had to have deeper roots inside the working class of each country in order to be a real movement with clear functioning statutes, which was not subject to internal man manipulation by the secret society kind of conspiracy favored by Bakunin and his followers. By 1868, Marx had already saw a new revolutionary crisis on the horizon, while the International was still a heterogeneous body of clashing interests, rather than a revolutionary instrument. The remaining condition for transforming the International into a more centralized and disciplined body was a greater degree of ideological homogeneity. The Brussels Congress marks, marked a great victory for Marx in this regard, in that he in that he succeeded in winning over a section of the Proudhonists to his own positions and defeating the Proudhonist diehards. The stage was now set for Marx's organizational plans. At the Basel Congress of 1869, held before Bakunin's operations became evident, Marx obtained the passage of a resolution that considerably increased the powers of the General Council, in particular giving it the right to suspend, pending the decision of the Congress, branches of the international that contravened its principles and decisions. Bakunin's secret attempts to create an organization within an organization, the so-called Alliance for Social Democracy, multiplied over the next two years so that by the time the London Conference met in September 1871, Marx was ready with his resolution, political action of the working class. This resolution, partly based on the lessons of the Paris Commune, which had been crushed the previous May, reminded the International of the preamble to its own rules, which Marx had drafted in 1864. These had spoken of the need to conquer political power and went on to define this in more concrete terms. It argued from the presence of an unbridled reaction which pretends to maintain by brute force the distinction of classes and the political domination of the property classes resulting from it. That the working class cannot act as a class except by constituting itself into a political party, distinct from and opposed to all old parties formed by the propertied classes. And that the constitution of the working class into a political party is indispensable in order to ensure the triumph of the social revolution and its ultimate end the abolition of classes. But such a party isn't the product of the simple will of a few individuals, nor does it spring spontaneously from the daily struggle of the class. 
whilst Marx and Engels both tried to take the IWMA from its initial limited association onto the terrain of a genuinely or a genuine political force. They also recognized that the program which the party would carry could be refined only in the light of proletarian experience. The importance of the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune of 1871 demonstrated how, in the very act of defending their own interests, the working class is the antithesis of capital. The revolutionary actions of the class led literally to revolutionary developments in its consciousness and therefore in the program defended by its class organizations. One of the great legacies of the First International is that it recognized the real significance of the Paris Commune for the development of proletarian consciousness. By unanimously voting for the publication of Marx's The Civil War in France on May 30th, 1871, two days after the final military defeat of the Commune, the General Council gave an internationalist answer to the bourgeois calumnies spreading about the commune and also made a major contribution to the development of working class consciousness. In the civil war in France, Marx once again speaks with the authentic voice of the communist revolution, untrammeled by the need to accommodate trades unionists and prudonists. The civil war in France echoes many of the ideas of consciousness put forward in the German ideology, but now made flesh. The working class did not expect miracles from the commune. They have no ready-made utopias to introduce par décret du, du peuple, by decree of the people. They know that to work out their own emancipation and along with it that higher form to which present society is irresistibly tending by its own economical agencies, they will have to pass through long struggles through a series of historic processes, transforming circumstances and men. They have no ideals to realize, but to set free the elements of the new society with which, with which old collapsing bourgeois society is pregnant. In the full consciousness of their historic mission and with the heroic resolve to act up to it, the working class can afford to smile at the coarse invective of the gentleman's gentleman with the pen and ink horn, and at the didactic patronage of well-wishing bourgeois doctrinaires, pouring forth their ignorant platitudes and sectarian crotchets. In the ora oracular tone of scientific infallibility, when the Paris Commune took the management of the revolution in its own hands, when plain working men, for the first time, dared to infringe upon the governmental privilege of their natural superiors and under circumstances of unexampled difficulty perform their work modestly conscientiously and efficiently performed it at salaries the highest of which barely amounted to one-fifth of what according to high scientific authority is the minimum required for the secretary to a certain metro metro metropolitan school board the old world writhed in convulsions of rage at the sight of the red flag, the symbol of the Republic of Labour floating over the Hotel de Ville. What was different about the Commune was that it was the first time the working class had acted independently to establish its own form of rule. Displacing the state machinery, the governmental machinery of the ruling classes by a governmental machinery of its own. Marx's refusal to draw up blueprints of the precise nature of a future communist society was vindicated by the commune. As Marx himself wrote, it was a thoroughly expansive political form, while all previous forms of government had been emphatically repressive. Its true secret was this. It was essentially a working class government, the product of the struggle of the producing against the appropriating class the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economical emancipation of labor. <clears throat> this is not the place to analyze in detail the enormous contribution the actions of commune made to the development of communist consciousness, but Marx basically identified the following as new ideas on which a future proletarian political body would have to be judged. The commune had abolished the standing army and replaced it with the armed people. It had introduced the idea of immediate recall of elected delegates 
and these delegates had no special pay or privileges. The commune itself was not a parliament or a ministry, but a working body combining all the features of all the branches of government. On top of this, the commune established an organizing principle for the whole of society from even the smallest hamlet. Perhaps most significantly, it was what Marx considered the living embodiment of the, of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Whilst the anarchist Bakunin had derided the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat by asking who was the class that the proletariat would be dictator over, Marx could reply that the, that, that the dictatorship was aimed at the old ruling classes, the slaveholders as he called them, who would periodically threaten the real task of the commune, which was the social and economic transformation of the condition of the exploited. Marx expected that every one of these slaveholder revolts would actually help to speed up the process of transformation of society so that the dictatorship of the proletariat would itself wither away to become a mere coordinator of the free movement of society. Marx also concluded that one reason for the weakness of the commune was its isolation to one geographical area. In fact, he had warned the communards of this danger even before March 18th. Finally, Marx concluded that the commune had opened up a new phase in the struggle. After the Franco-Prussian War, the French ruling class had only been able to crush the commune with the aid of their former German foes. Bismarck, the new chancellor of a united Germany, had allowed Thiers, the monarchist French president, to have his army of 40,000 to crush the workers of Paris. Marx thus concluded that class rule is no longer able to disguise itself in national uniform. The national governments are as one against the proletariat. And to underline the impact that the commune had on the development of communist ideas, Marx and Engels added an, intro an introduction to a new German edition of the Communist Manifesto, which appeared in 1872. Whilst they did not feel they could alter the old text, since it was now itself a part of proletarian history, they now stated that no special stress is laid on the revolutionary measures proposed at the end of Section 2. This program has in some details become antiquated. These antiquated details would now include such issues as nationalization of the means of production, which the march of history has shown can be carried out to defend capitalist interests rather than advance proletarian expropriation. However, this was not so apparent in, in 1872. The really significant change comes when Marx and Engels go on to deal with the question of the revolutionary transformation of the state. One thing especially was proved by the commune, that the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purpose. The quote is from the Civil War in France. From now on, it was clear that the working class would have to smash the existing state in order to create a new social and economic order. As our concern here is proletarian consciousness, this is also the point to underline the fact this insight was provided by Marx himself. Whilst the Paris workers themselves died fighting trying to storm heaven, and whilst good histories were written by participants, it was Marx who drew the conclusions from the struggle. This process came as no surprise to Marx himself. In the first place, his ideas were not based on ideas or principles that have been invented, but on the real movement going on before the very eyes of humanity. Secondly, Marx wasn't embarrassed by the idea that a bourgeois ideologist like himself was articulating this message, since in the conditions of the 19th century, the bulk of the working class did not even get elementary education initially considered too dangerous by the capitalist class. Although there were workers who did manage to overcome this handicap, such as, for example, Wheatling and Ditskin, it overwhelmingly fell to people like himself, who have raised themselves to the level of comprehending theoretically the historical movement as a whole. The later debate about spontaneity and organization in the development of class consciousness involving Kotsky, Plekhanov, Lenin and Luxembourg, amongst others, was to confuse the class origins of the theorists with the fact that the proletariat's consciousness is not acquired in a direct fashion, but only by reflection on its own practice.
This is one of the central arguments which confirms why the proletariat needs a permanent revolutionary organization to carry its own collective hist historic memory. We will, we will return to this issue later, but we can begin by stating that the message of the civil war in France was unfortunately largely lost on a new wave of proletarian leaders, in particular in Germany. The critique of the Gotha program. The Marx party triumphed in the first international, but it was a Pyrrhic victory. Marx had hoped that the international would become a force for unity amongst the proletariat and that national sections would be formed, which would affiliate to it. By 1876, both he and Engels had come to realize that the process would have to be restarted, but from solid national parties, which would then affiliate to the international. So the first international was quietly buried in Philadelphia. The collapse of the international was followed by the rise of socialist parties within each national territory. This was particularly important in Germany, where the international had been weak and the proletariat had been divided between the followers of Ferdinand Lasalle and Marx's own rather shaky d disciple Wilhelm Leibniz. After Lasalle's death in a duel in 1864, his party, the ADAV, German General Workers' Union, continued to support the idea that universal suffrage would bring the workers to power. And if that failed, the reactionary aristocratic clique at the top of the Prussian state would concede aid for workers' cooperatives. LaSalle also secretly courted Bismarck, thinking that the feudal parties were the common ally of the proletariat against the industrial bourgeoisie. However, it wasn't until 1869 in Eisenach that Leibniz, with a young worker, August, August Bebel, was able to found a rival party to the ADAV the Social Democratic Workers' Party, SDAP. Marx tried to treat both parties equally in the hope of promoting their unity, but all his tact was useless in the face of the boneheaded refusal of, Lis of the Lasallians. However, both parties affiliated to the IWMA, and when the Eisenachers bravely came out against the Franco-Prussian War with the slogan, not a man, not a penny, for this system, Bismarck persecuted both parties equally. This was the basis for the unification into the German Social Democratic Workers' Party at Gotha in 1875. The phase in the workers' movement, which we call social democracy, had opened up. It was to be dominated until World War I by the Second International, founded in 1889. This was to be another major turning point in the history of the world working class as, for the first time in history, the proletariat, at least in Europe, now formed mass movements which claimed to embody a clear alternative to the prevailing capitalist societies. These new movements, however, did not come without their problems from the point of view of revolutionary Marxism. Marx and Engels were scathing about the lack of programmatic clarity of the Germans and were equally worried about the developments in Britain and France. One need only remember Marx's famous comment, reported by Engels to Lefargue on the French party, that if they were his followers, then ce qu'il y a de certain, c'est que moi je ne suis pas Marxiste. One thing's for sure, I'm not a Marxist. However, it was the German party that took up the bulk of their attention. <clears throat> when Marx and Engels discovered that the Gotha program for unity was full of Lasallian program for Lasallian theoretical blunders, they tore it apart. <clears throat> for them, it was a step back from the Eisenachers' own program. Their marginal notes to the program of the German Workers' Party has ever since been known by its real purpose as the critique of the Gotha program. Sending it to Willem Brack, Marx wrote a covering letter, which makes his opinion clear in a nutshell. It is my duty not to give recognition, even by diplomatic silence, to what in my opinion is a thoroughly objectionable program that demoralizes the party. But this is precisely what Marx and Engels did. Their critique was not published until Engels issued it, when the SPD as again sliding towards a confused programmatic position in relation to capitalism in January 1891. 
This was important since it allowed the programmatic confusion of the SPD, which Marx said was no better than a bourgeois party. The internationalism of the program stands infinitely below that of the free trade party to continue without a clear public statement of criticism. Marx in the same letter went on to say, every step of real movement is more important than a dozen programs. If therefore it was not possible and the conditions of the time did not permit it to go beyond the Eisenach program, one should simply have concluded an agreement for action against the common enemy. The first sentence is often quoted in isolation by those who think that Marx was arguing for a spontaneous approach to class consciousness. But in actual fact, what he is doing is expressing the real dismay at the program that was agreed on. This was not a step forward in the real movement, but a recipe for confusion and worse. The program of the proletarian organization is its basic point of departure. If it is not carrying forward the gains made politically by the revolutionary working class, what is it doing? What Marx was arguing for was to get the Lasallians to work with the Eisenachers to demonstrate in actual practice their confusions before writing a new program. Engels confirmed this in a letter to Bebel in March 1875, where he repeated all the programmatic critis criticisms of Marx. Most presciently, he condemned the fact that the principle that the workers' movement is an international movement is to all intents and purposes completely disavowed for the present day and that by people who have upheld this principle most gloriously for five whole years under the most difficult conditions. Engels is here referring to the fight against Bismarck's war on France, which Leibniz and Bebel and the Eisenach party had so ably led. It was the war issue which was to reveal how rotten the SPD had become in 1914. Engels concluded his letter by telling Bebel that he and Marx might have to condemn everything the new party stands for. He adds, In general, the official program of a party is of less importance than what the party does. But a new program is after all a banner publicly raised and the outside world judges the party by it. And especially a proletarian party since this is its function. More immediately significant was the problem that that this banner was so multicolored that it did not even give a lead to the German Social Democratic Party members. This was particularly problematical in Germany, where the failure <clears throat> of the democratic bourgeoisie to carry out the national revolution, which was carried out by the reactionary landowning cl clique of Bismarck in order to preserve their aristocratic privileges meant that many erstwhile liberals and Democrats wandered into the Social Democratic Party. Marx himself had prevented a well-known lawyer from entering the General Council of the First International because he recognized that he was someone who was politically ambitious in the bourgeois sense and would bring alien class positions to the International. Whilst he had no objections to non-proletarians in general joining, he also was aware that to flood the organization with such figures before there was a solid proletarian base was dangerous. <clears throat> the German Social Democrats had no such inhibitions and soon were swamped by a series of reactionary ideas from the so-called catheter professor socialists to Eugene During's attempt to undermine the materialist interpretation of history. At first, Marx and Engels tried to operate behind the scenes in personal letters. Engels explained to Bebel that in fact the bourgeois, the bourgeois jackasses who commented on the Gotha program had not even read it before. So long as our opponents as well as the workers continue to read our views into that program, we are justified in saying nothing about it. That was a letter from Engels to Bebel. The fight for revolutionary consciousness in the SPD. <clears throat> However, such tact cannot be maintained. Engels had expected that the new party would not last two years, but in 1877, Marx was telling him that the Gotha program has degraded the party both in theory and practice. To F.A. Sorge, he wrote, a rotten spirit is making itself felt in our party in Germany, not so much among the masses as among the leaders, upper class and workers. The compromise with the Lasallians has led to a compromise with other halfway elements too. In Berlin, 
with during and his ad admirers, and moreover with a whole gang of half-mature students and supervised doctors of philosophy who want to give socialism a superior idealistic orientation, that is to say, to replace its materialistic basis, which demands serious objective study from anyone who tries to use it, by modern mythology with its goddesses of oh, goddesses of justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Right. Thus, by 1878, Marx and Engels were forced into the open to deal with these threats. These underlines or this underlines three things in the development of proletarian class consciousness. As it is indirect, it has to be fought for in open debate and discussion. It is also not enough for someone to clothe themselves in a label socialism to be taken at their word. Class consciousness demands class clarity. To some, the debates in the workers' movement can, can appear tiresome, and they often are. But without clarification about the nature and course of socialist revolution, there can be no revolutionary movement. Marx and Engels are sometimes treated as if they were Aaron and Moses, who it, who it is simply enough to quote, usually out of their historical context, and that is enough. Nothing would have been more horrifying to them. As their numerous letters at this period of German social democracy make clear, they bequeathed no system. They left that to the air Durings and their intellectually lazy followers. Of these types, Marx later wrote, the party can very well manage without such intellectuals whose first principle is to teach what they have not learned. Engels, with assistance from Marx, published his anti during in 1878, denouncing the anti-materialist and anti-Semitic professor. But it caused a furor in the party. Joanne Most, during's strongest supporter, tried to ban its publication. But this was not the last battle for revolutionary clarity that Marx and Engels had to make in the German party. In 1879, they issued a seminal document, the so-called circular letter to the various leaders of the German party. The letter was a response to the publication of the new paper of the German Social Democratic Party, Die Social Democrat. <laughs> Aww. Due to Bismarck's anti-socialist laws, this had to be published in Zurich under an editorial board consisting of what Marx called a social philanthropist, Karl Hochberg, the only man to buy his way into the party, and two followers of During, one of which was the young Edward Bernstein. They had written an article purporting to be a history of the party until that time, but which was really an argument for abandoning revolutionary socialism and cooperating with Bismarck by working within his anti-socialist laws, since it was the SPD's own fault that they had been passed because they had been too radical. Marx and Engels were mystified. How the party can tolerate the authors of this article in its midst, midst any longer is incomprehensible to us, and then gave their own views. As for ourselves, in view of our whole past, there is only one road open to us, for almost 40 years, we have emphasized that class struggle is the immediate driving power of history, and in particular, that the class struggle between bourgeoisie and proletariat is the great lever of the modern social revolution. We, therefore, cannot possibly cooperate with people who wish to expunge this class struggle from the movement. When the International was formed, we expressly formulated the battle cry. The emancipation of the working classes must be achieved by the working classes themselves. We cannot therefore cooperate with people who openly state that the workers are too uned uneducated to emancipate themselves and must be freed from above by philanthropic persons from the upper and lower middle classes. If the new party organ adopts a line that corresponds to the views of these gentlemen, that is middle class and not proletarian, then nothing remains for us. Much though we should regret it, but publicly to declare our opposition to it. But once again, Marx and Engels never carried through this threat. Indeed, Bernstein had already read Anti-During and claimed to be a Marxist. 
He came to London with Bebel to pacify the two old men and was so successful that he became the sole editor of Social Democrat. From this base, he became a leading theorist of the party and even went on to become Engels's literary ex executor. <clears throat> How was it that the father of revisionism should be nurtured under Engels' Engels's eyes? Since Marx and Engels had always argued tactically for using parliamentary means to prop propagandize for socialism, some had begun to confuse means and ends. It was a confusion that Marx and Engels contributed to because they began to see the growing mass movement of social democracy as encompassing the whole of the working class. <clears throat> At that point in history, the working class was not so much under bourgeois ideological domination as today. There were as yet few mass circulation papers aimed at the working class except those printed by the Social Democrats and of course, there was no electronic mass media of any kind. In 1890, only seven years after Marx's death, the German SDP won nearly one and a half million votes, making them the largest single party in Germany, and they were still illegal. The question now was, would parliamentary methods allow the Socialist Party to take power peacefully? Such a view stood four square against the idea of the class struggle reiterated by Marx in the circular letter of 1879. Even where Marx had made concessions to the idea of a peaceful road to power, as in his speech in Amster Amsterdam in 1872, he had only limited this to certain countries like England, America, and possibly Holland. Even here, he had said that this was dependent on the behavior of the capitalist class. Everywhere else, he insisted that force must be the lever of our revolutions. Nowhere did Marx actually state that parliamentary struggle could bring the workers to power, and he even denounced the SDP leaders for their support of Bismarck's abandonment of free trade in the Reichstag. They are so far affected by parliamentary cretinism that they think they are above criticism. <clears throat> On the contrary, he pointed out repeatedly that the ruling class are unlikely to see themselves le legislated out of their property without a fight. An historical development can remain peaceful only so long as it pro its progress is not forcibly obstructed by those wielding social power at the time. If in England, for instance, the working class were to gain a majority in Parliament, they could by lawful means rid themselves of such laws and institutions as impeded their development. However, the peaceful movement might be transformed into a forcible one by resistance on the part of those interested in restoring the former state of affairs. Marx is here speaking hypothetically. He could not possibly have known that the very movements which were supposed to represent the workers would be the agents for carrying the bourgeois infection of parliamentarism into the working class. Engels was to get a glimpse of it before he died. In the debate over the Erfurt program, he had to publish the critique of the Gotha program in order to see off the followers of George Vollmer, who wanted a parliamentary road and who wanted also to make alliances with bourgeois parties. At the same time, Engels also rebuffed the Jugend Youth, a group of intellectuals who wanted to abandon using the parliamentary forum altogether because this would have cut the party off from a tribune where it could make propaganda. Engels, though, never once said that socialists should or could win a parliamentary majority. He viewed parliamentary campaigns and even parliamentary successes as provoking the bourgeoisie to repression and thus paving the way for the final struggle. Commenting on the Erfurt program in 1891, Engels wrote that the experience of Germany proves how totally mistaken is the belief that a communist society can be established in a cozy, peaceful way. Imagine, therefore, Engels' horror when, having been asked to write a new introduction for a German version of the class struggle in France in 1895, he became a victim of social democratic opportunism and maneuvering. Libnik published it in Vorwarts, but cut out all references to the need for violent overthrow of the state. Engels wrote to Paul Lefargue. Libnicht has just played me a nice trick. 
he has taken from my introduction to Marx's articles on France of 1848 to 50, everything that would serve him to support the tactics of peace at any price and of opposition to force, to force and violence, which it has pleased him for some time now to preach, especially at present when coercive laws are being prepared in Berlin. But I am preaching these tactics only for the Germany of today, and they may become in inapplicable tomorrow. Engels attempted to have this corrected in Kotsky's paper, Newsight, but even here a key paragraph which stated that street fighting would be necessary, but it would have to be undertaken with greater forces, was omitted. And as the edition of Newsight came out after Engels' death, he never knew how he had been distorted. Indeed, the true text was not published until the revolutionary wave had already failed in 1924. Before this happened, therefore, revolutionaries like Rosa Luxemburg had to portray themselves as disagreeing with Engels against the increasingly parliamentary-minded majority who would eventually denature the proletarian character of social democracy to the point where they voted, for, voted war credits for their own governments on August 4th, 1914, <clears throat> at the founding Congress of the German Communist Party, December 30th, 1918, to January 1st, 1919. Luxembourg made a dramatic speech which, sum which summed up what had happened to social democracy. Thenceforward, the tactics expounded by Engels in 1895 guided the German social democrats in everything they did and in everything they left undone, down to the appropriate finish of August 4th, 1914. The 4th of August did not come out of a clear blue sky. What happened on the 4th of August was not a chance turn of affairs, but was the logical outcome of all the German socialists had been doing for many years. After Engels' death in 1895, in the theoretical field, the leadership of the party passed into the hands of Kotsky. The upshot of his change was that the upshot of this change was that at every annual congress, <clears throat> the energetic protests of the left wing against a purely parliamentarist policy, its urgent warnings against the sterility and the danger of such a policy were stigmatized as anarchism, anarchizing socialism, or at least anti-Marxism. What officially passed for Marxism became a cloak for all possible kinds of opportunism, for a persistent shirking of the revolutionary class struggle, for every conceivable half-measure, Thus, the German social democracy and the labor movement, the trade union movement as well, were condemned to pine away within the framework of capitalist society. No longer did German socialists and trade unionists make any serious attempt to overthrow capitalist institutions or to put the capitalist machine out of gear. Once again, we see the seminal importance of having a clear programmatic basis for the revolutionary working class. In this case, the distortion of Engels' real views and those that he and Marx had fought for all their lives became absolutely the fulcrum on which German socialism passed over to its support for capitalism. Luxembourg sums up brilliantly a whole process that went on inside the largest party of the Second International in the passage above but it was in fact more complicated than this. With Engels dead, his close associate Bernstein once again reared his anti-Marxist head. However, he went too far for even the parliamentary Cretans like Libnicht and Bebel when he asserted that all Marx's major predictions about the immiseration of the working class and the increased tendency to crisis of capitalism had been disproved. In 1898, Bebel opened the official debate against him, which lasted until 1904. During that time, Kotsky took up the fight against Bernstein and was thus able to stand alongside the revolutionary Marxists, like Rosa Luxemburg, whose reform or revolution remained the best reply to revisionism, as Bernstein's ideas were known as the guardian of orthodoxy. By 1904, Bernstein was defeated by the battle against him. Oops. By 1904, Bernstein was defeated, but the battle against him had created an illusion that Kotsky 
one of the manipulators of Engels' last writings, was now the real heir to the Marxist heritage. <clears throat> In actual fact, as the First World War was to prove, he actually shared the Bernstein view that socialism was possible without revolution. The two joined together in the centrist USPD during the war. It also further disguised another issue which Engels could not possibly have foreseen. Engels assumed that every vote for the SPD was another worker conquered for socialism. What he did not see was that the SPD being not only ambiguous, but what socialism was and how it was to be arrived, arrived at. Ugh not only ambiguous about what socialism was and how it was to be arrived at, was not itself a revolutionary body, something only proved in 1914. The historical experience of social democracy came to demonstrate that, under the conditions of capitalist domination, it is unlikely that the majority of workers will arrive at a vision of communism before the revolution. The mass of the class will have to reject capitalism but it is only in the process of forming a revolutionary society that the majority of workers will become fully aware of what that society involves. Marx puts it better. The alteration of men on a mass scale is necessary, an alteration which can only take place in a practical movement, a revolution. This revolution is necessary, therefore, not only because the ruling class <clears throat> cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only in a revolution succeed in ridding itself of the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew. Social democracy was thus something of an illusion. Its Erfurt program of 1891 had contained a division between the maximum program and the minimum program. Whilst the former was revolutionary, calling for the overthrow of capitalism, the latter was reformist, demanding only improved conditions under capitalism. Whilst its leadership could argue about the political tactics for opposing capitalism, the maximum program, its trades union movement and its other bodies could simply get on with the business of finding out how to live under capitalism. Nor was the striving for the minimum program the worst aspect of the situation. Social democracy, particularly at the trades union level, was riddled with racism and imperialism. The speeches of union leaders like David, Ligon, etc. all support the idea that imperialism brings progress to backward races. Backward races is in quotations. And of course, there is only one thing worse than a class which is confused in the face of imperialist war, and that is one which has a trusted leadership which has already accepted the premises of the class enemy. What the history of social democracy proved is that it is not size, but revolutionary consciousness, which is the key issue in the overthrow of capitalism. This, however, only throws into debate what the nature of a revolutionary party and its relationship to the entire class is. This was the debate that opened up on the left wing of social democracy in the years before the First World War. This forms the focus of the next chapter. Chapter 5 On the Eve of Revolution The Debate Between Luxembourg and Lenin The Argument So Far We have argued that the working class is the only force which can overthrow capitalism and replace it with a mode of production based on the satisfaction of needs rather than production for profit. We have further argued that the working class has this role in the process, not through any innate moral superiority, but because it is the only class which has no form of property to defend. As the ultimate exploited class, its interest in the abolition of its own exploitation also means the end of all human exploitation. <clears throat> this lack of property, however, means that the proletariat is historically unique as a revolutionary class. It cannot abolish itself without first realizing itself. In other words, it has to be aware of its goal and its own collective strength. This means that what the proletariat also creates as, as part of the process of emancipation is its own consciousness. Although this arises from the conditions of exploitation, it does not arise uniformly or at the same time. <clears throat> 
Otherwise, capitalism would have disappeared decades ago. It arises now here, then there. Local defeats snuff it out and limited victories give it oxygen. What this constant antithesis between workers and capital creates is a body of proletarians who retain the memory of struggle and understand that the greater goal is the overthrow of the exploiting system itself. These same proletarians, an advance guard of the whole class, if you like, seek not only to generalize the memory of the last struggle, but to define the program for the future. The struggle for proletarian self-emancipation thus presupposes the existence of a political organization, a political party. However, this stated, there are more questions to be answered. What is the relationship of the party to the rest of the class? What is the process by which the mass of the class itself comes to communist consciousness? In the last chapter, we looked at the experience of the development of the mass social democratic movement, which developed after the death of Marx, and in the last years of Engels. We discussed how the movement became seduced by the possibility of arriving at power through bourgeois legality, despite the fact that this stood absolutely foursquare against the revolutionary heart of Marxist thinking. We also showed that the debate on revisionism not only galvanized the left wing of social democracy, but in some ways was a sidetrack. which obscured the gradual movement of social democracy into the capitalist camp. This was not obvious until the Great War of 1914, but in the years that led up to that cataclysm, the left amongst the social democrats carried out a lively and serious debate about the nature of class consciousness and political organization. <clears throat> it is to this that we now turn a new generation of revolutionaries. 20 years after the death of Marx, the very nature of social democracy came under the scrutiny of a new generation of revolutionaries. Rosa, Lux Rosa Luxemburg and Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, who eventually took the pen name Lenin, were both born in the Russian Empire in 1870. Both were to become in different ways icons of revolutionary Marxism, something they would have both resented. However, the mythology of revolutionaries lives on after them, and they are impotent to correct it after they are dead. Posterity has tended to, de tended to demonize Lenin for his success and sanctify Luxembourg for her failure. In fact, they not only shared the same spirit of revolutionary Marxism, but they were closer in their attitudes on the questions of class consciousness and political organization than bourgeois histories allow. The economic and the political. Lenin has always been regarded as a cynical manipulator in the eyes of his critics. This largely stems from what he wrote in his famous early pamphlet, What is to be Done. For his detractors, the original sin of Lenin dates from his famous statement on the strikes in Russia in the 1890s. These strikes were simply trades union struggles, not yet social democratic struggles. They marked the awakening antagonism between workers and employers, but the workers were not and could not be conscious of the irreconcilable antagonism of their interests to the whole of the modern political and social system, i.e. theirs was not yet social democratic consciousness. <clears throat> we have said that there could not have been social democratic consciousness among the workers. It would have to be brought to them from without. The whole history of all countries shows that the working class, exclusively by its own effort, is able to develop only trades union consciousness, i.e. the conviction that it is necessary to combine in unions, fight the employers, and strive to compel the government to pass necessary labor legislation, etc. The theory of socialism, however, grew out of the philosophic, historical, and economic theories elaborated by the educated representatives of the property classes, by intellectuals. By their social status, the founders of modern scientific socialism, Marx and Engels themselves, belong to the bourgeois intelligentsia. From the point of view of historical materialism, we obviously have to reject Lenin's formulation or at least correct it. 
Marx and Engels may have been educated, but their scientific studies had led them away from being the educated representatives of any class, but the proletariat. As we stated in the earlier parts of this text, Marx did not see himself as elaborating a theory, but addressing the reality that confronted the society he happened to live in. His premises were real, and he was quite clear that he had gone over to the proletariat as a result of understanding the reality of exploitation. Lenin was in fact erroneously recycling here the arguments of Kotsky and Plekhanov about the importance of intellectuals, who in the conditions of the time had to come from the privileged classes. However, the central core of truth in Lenin's views was the idea that communist, or as he put it in the terms of the time, social democratic, consciousness was not a direct reflection of the immediate struggle of the working class for survival under the capitalist system. The economic struggle could continue forever unless someone or somebody put forward the real explanation as to why the proletariat was exploited. At the time, only those who had the leisure and the education, clearly not workers who worked 12 to 14 hours a day, could elaborate those theories. But they did so on the basis of the real existing class struggle. Lenin clearly explained this, explains this in the rest of his large pamphlet. Contrary to those who insist that Lenin was saying that workers were thick, he pointed to the scientific contributions of exceptional workers like Wilhelm Waitling and even Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. But what Lenin stresses is that they had had to escape from the shop floor to be in a position to make their contributions. The issue then is not who clarifies the class consciousness, but how is that class consciousness to be carried forward? Here, Lenin is at one with the founders of scientific socialism. Class consciousness is not the direct reflection of the daily material existence of the proletariat, but is an indirect product based on reflection on the lessons of the high points of proletarian struggle. Lenin, it has to be remembered, was arguing here against those trends in the nascent Russian social democratic movement that argued that economic struggles were the only really important ones and that politics was irrelevant. This was particularly the case with the new younger Lenin Martov, both in their early 30s, were now the old leaders around papers like Rabochea Missile, Workers' Thought, Rabochtiello, Workers' Cause, and the programmatic statement Credo. They had arisen when the early social democratic organizations had been smashed by the Tsar's secret police and their leaders exiled or imprisoned. The new leaders were intellectuals who glorified the spontaneity of the everyday struggle, but gave it no effective leadership. <clears throat> in fact, Lenin was far from saying that workers could not take in theory. He was arguing that these amateurs were not giving any leadership and the workers were losing confidence in socialism because they saw these people as a menace who brought police raids in their wake. Lenin excoriated their handicraft methods and stated no less than six times in what is to be done, that it was the lag of leaders behind the spontaneous upsurge of the masses which was causing the real crisis in working class politics in Russia. This is a rebuttal of the myriad of lazy critics, whether anarchists, councilists, or anti-working class liberals, who look for any reason not to support the October Revolution. They jump from the mistaken conclusion that Lenin said the workers were thick to the tragic way in which the party dictatorship replaced the proletarian dictatorship after the revolution of 1917. And for them, you need to say no more. The October Revolution was thus all the product of the thinking of one man. Ignored is the fact that what is to be done was written in a particular context, context of illegality in Tsarist Russia before the 1905 revolution. Lenin himself, as Lars Lee has pointed out in the preface to his 2005 work, Lenin Rediscovered What is to be Done in Context, referred to it last in 1907. And this, this was only to say that the basic mistake made by people who polemicize with what is to be done 
at the present time is that they tear this production completely out of a specific historical context, out of a specific and by now long past period in the development of a party. What is to be done plays no part in any of the discussions around the time of the revolution. It was not referred to in the ABC of communism produced by Bukharin and Pri oh, fuck, I hate this name. Priobrazensky in 1919, and reference to it was only revived in the late 1920s when the Russian Revolution had long lost its proletarian character. What is consistent in Lenin's thinking, right up to and even beyond 1917, is that he is well aware of the real relationship between the daily struggle and the historical struggle of the working class. In 1899, he had already written, every strike brings thoughts of socialism very forcibly to the worker's mind. Thoughts of the struggle of the entire working class for emancipation from the oppression of capital. A strike, moreover, opens the eyes of the workers to the nature, not only of the capitalists, but of the government and the laws as well. Also ignored is the fact that Lenin himself, after the Bolsheviks had led the proletariat to power, continually exhorted the workers to take charge of their own destiny. Many examples can be found, but one will suffice to illustrate the point here. It is important for us to draw literally all working class people into the government of the state. It is a task of tremendous difficulty, but socialism cannot be implemented by a minority, by the party. It can be implemented only by tens of millions when they have learned to do it for themselves. At the same time, Lenin's arguments are no mere historically limited, dated tirade. Some of what he writes has validity for today. The spontaneous development of the working class movement leads to its subordination to bourgeois ideology. For the spontaneous working class movement is trade unionism and trades unionism means the ideological enslavement of the workers by the bourgeoisie. But why, the reader will ask, does, does the spontaneous movement, the movement along the line of least resistance, lead to the domination of bourgeois ideology? <clears throat> For the simple reason, the bourgeois ideology is far older in origin than socialist ideology, that it is more fully developed and that it has at its disposal immeasurably more means of dissemination. <clears throat> Hence, our task, the task of social democracy, is to combat spontaneity, to divert the working class movement from this spontaneous trade unionist striving to come under the wing of the bourgeoisie and to bring it under the wing of revolutionary social democracy. What Lenin was arguing, which remains true to today, is that the ideas program and platform of the party are the outcome of the total material process taking place in society, <clears throat> a process which is above all historical. The daily struggle of the class does not create this whole view and more than the abstract thinking or any more than the abstract thinking of the greatest theorists. When the daily class struggle bursts out of the trade union struggle, out of the confines of capitalist legality into moments of insurrection, then the class movement and class consciousness take great leaps forward. But when these movements die down, the experience lives on only in the one historical body, which can maintain that consciousness. And this is the revolutionary political party. This party is not something that has no relationship with the class movement. It is not a, a dus ex machina, but a central element in the dialectical and contradictory process which leads towards the formation of a communist consciousness within the working class, which is directly derived from material reality. When Lenin was arguing that consciousness would have to be brought to the working class from without, he meant that this, this consciousness would have to be brought from outside the physical boundaries of the daily class struggle itself. He did not mean that it was outside the process taking place in society itself. As we already noted, it is true that Lenin did quote approvingly at length from Kotsky to support his idea that spontaneity in the daily struggle was not enough to create revolutionary consciousness. 
This quote contained Kotsky's unashamedly elitist view that the vehicle of science is not the proletariat, but the bourgeois intelligentsia. According to Kotsky, it was in the minds of this stratum that modern socialism originated. This is, of course, fundamentally wrong and anti-Marxist. As readers of the first two chapters of this study will realize, it goes directly against what Marx and Engels wrote in the German ideology. This was a period when bourgeois intellectuals claiming to be socialist thought they knew what was best for the working class. Lenin was not particularly interested in that part of Kotsky's thinking, as his subsequent writings make clear, and had not yet realized that Kotsky was already a renegade to Marxism. Indeed, it is quite clear that Lenin rejects this view of Kotsky in that he thought that the best candidates for professional revolutionaries were workers, the average people of the masses, who are capable, in fact, are alone capable, of determining the outcome of the movement. Today, the problem is not who elaborates revolutionary consciousness, but what is to be the vehicle, and that has to be a permanent political body, a political party. The statement that the daily economic struggle does not create socialist, communist, revolutionary consciousness of itself is so obvious that it would never have been contested if it had not been for the experience of the of the degeneration of the Russian Revolution. We will look at this later, but let us first round off the debate in Russian social democracy in 1902-03. If what Lenin's economist opponents were saying had been true, and subsequent anti-partyists still echo them there, is, then there is no need for a revolutionary party. The class struggle cannot be abolished the reasoning goes. It is inevitable, and so therefore is revolutionary consciousness. Unfortunately, this is not true, and the historical experience of the British working class has shown it time after time. The British working class went through a century of the fiercest economic battles in the 19th century. It created massive trades unions, defined itself, and was aware of itself as a class yet failed to create for itself a socialist revolutionary consciousness. Quite the contrary, the advanced sector of the British proletariat, the unionized workers, functioned as a wing of the liberal bourgeoisie without maintaining its class. Independence. Even leading members of the first international who came from this background eventually became liberal MPs. This is exactly what Lenin argued. Not that the economic struggle of the class must remain non-political if communists abstain, but that its politicization will take a bourgeois form. Since there can be no talk of an independent ideology formulated by the working masses themselves in the course of their movement, the only choice is either bourgeois or socialist ideology. There is no middle course, for mankind has not created a third ideology, and moreover, in a society torn by class antagonisms, there can never be a non-class or an above-class ideology. Hence, to belittle socialist ideology in any way, to turn aside from it in the slightest degree, means to strengthen bourgeois ideology. Anti-capitalists of today could reflect on these words. You cannot be anti-capitalist without being communist. Instead of glib talk about third ways, they should recognize that no such beast exists. Historical experience in Britain, though once again confirms the validity of Lenin's argument. In the general strike in Britain in 1926, the working class under the influence of syndicalists paralyzed the bourgeoisie for nine days. But these syndicalists had no political program and assumed that the movement would of itself bring down capitalism. Instead, the more bourgeois labor leaders went to 10 Downing Street, and when Baldwin gave them the alternative of supporting the British state or the British working class, they chose the state. <clears throat> we could also quote the experience of the U.S. working class in the 20th century, which has mirrored the experience of the British in the 19th. By raising the level of consciousness of the individual worker through collective struggle to that of identification with the rest of the class, 
the economic struggle opens the possibility for the development of revolutionary class consciousness, but only the possibility. Without the intervention of the party, translating the historical program of the working class into the material struggle of today, the class consciousness of workers will decline or will even take a reactionary direction, as the bourgeoisie are fond of pointing out. <clears throat> Indeed, class identity alone can be compatible with reactionary ideology. Sometimes the most reactionary workers are amongst the most conscious of belonging to the working class. In the great strikes in South Africa after World War I, the mobilizing slogan of the strikers in the Rand Rebellion of 1922 was workers of the world unite and fight for a white South Africa. After what is to be done. The party as the bearer of the program of the revolutionary achievements of the working class is at the core of Lenin's arguments. He was fully aware that steps in real movement were worth more than programs, but steps in real movement <clears throat> are often far apart in working class history. In the meantime, the carrier of revolutionary class consciousness is the party. It goes without saying that every step of real movement is more important than a dozen programs, as Karl Marx said. But neither Marx nor any other theoretician or practical worker in the social democratic movement has ever denied the tremendous importance of a program for the consolidation and consistent activity of a political party. It is sometimes argued that Lenin revised the ideas of what is to be done or even rejected them altogether after the first Russian Revolution of 1905. But let us be clear about what Lenin corrected. He never once varied from the idea that the party was the bearer of revolutionary consciousness from the fact that its program was the distillation of the proletariat's past experiences. Indeed, what is to be done was aimed at a current which was already in decline, economism, which had been more influential than the, fo than the followers of the social democratic paper Iskra in 1900, was already collapsing by 1902. Oh crap, I did it again. In a country like Russia, where trades unions were illegal, every economic strike became almost immediately a political strike. Any organization which was agnostic on this issue was doomed. What Lenin did want to correct was the bits he had written previously about the nature and structure of the party. Lenin was clear that the German social democratic model of an open party was not possible under the, uh, uh, the autocratic police state of the Tsar. This is why he called at this time for a party of a new type, a small secret party consisting only of professional revolutionaries, preferably of workers rather than the disorganized Russian intellectual type, had to be taken on who could stay out of the clutches of the police whilst they spread propaganda and agitation. This was the body which could transform the sparks of consciousness generated by the daily fight against capital into a political basis for attacking the state. The revolution of 1905 changed this. After, after the Tsar conceded a constitution, it was now possible to go for a mass enrollment of workers in the ambiguous conditions of the period when elections to the parliament or Duma before 1914 gave some scope for legal work. Rosa Luxemburg and the party. In terms of class consciousness and organization, Rosa Luxemburg is often cited by bourgeois commentators as the antithesis of Lenin, a Marxist who wasn't dictatorial and who was tolerant. Even would-be revolutionaries saturated with years of anti-Leninist propaganda looked to her as someone who formulated a critique of Lenin's mechanical tendencies and therefore provides a more dialectical basis to understand the question of class consciousness. For example, Franz Borkino, an influential ex-communist, wrote a history of the Communist International in which he insisted that Lenin, instead of the belief in proletarian revolution, had put his hopes in a centralized group under his leadership. Rosa Luxemburg alone continued to believe in the proletariat. This is a glori glorious balderization, but one which is frequently believed by those unwilling to find out for themselves. 
It may come as shock to some of them that far from being a blind worshipper of spontaneity against the party, Luxembourg, even in her 1904 critique of Lenin, stressed the need for a proletarian vanguard conscious of its class interests and capable of self-direction in political activity. And far from raising spontaneity above organization, she insisted that a party was needed which possesses the gift of political mobility complemented by unflinching loyalty to principles and concern for unity. After the Russian Revolution, Luxembourg only reinforced this view. Thus, it is clear that in every revolution, only that party is capable of seizing the leadership and power which has the courage to issue the appropriate slogans <clears throat> for driving the revolution ahead and the courage to draw all the necessary conclusions from the situation. She went on to say that only the Bolsheviks had grasped the true dialectic of, rev of revolutions and to stand the wisdom of parliamentary moles on its head not through a majority to revolutionary tactics, but through revolutionary tactics to a majority. That is the way the road runs. Only a party which knows how to lead, that is to advance things, wins support in stormy times. Whatever a party could offer of courage, revolutionary farsightedness, and inconsistency in a historic hour, Lenin, Trotsky, and other comrades have given, it, given in good measure. So, what is the difference between Luxembourg and Lenin on class consciousness? To explain this, we have to again understand the context in which the two were writing. Whilst Lenin regarded the economists as the Russian version of Bernstein's revisionism, Luxembourg had come to see that German social democracy was suffering from another disease. Whilst Lenin was trying to get rid of amateurism in Russia, the professional revolutionaries whom Luxembourg met every day in Germany were far from the ideal of Lenin. In fact, they were careerists, trade union bureaucrats, the petty clerks of a bureaucratic party machine, reformist parliamentarians. They were the ones who, scared of losing their petty privileges, would lead German social democracy into collusion with the German military and support the imperialist war of 1914. The centralism of effort, which Lenin realized was essential to get all Russia's scattered socialists together, was already caricatured by the conduct of many socialists in the German party. Luxembourg poses the central dilemma best in the following passage. On the one hand, we have the mass. On the other hand, its historic goal, located outside existing society. On the one hand, we have the day-to-day -day struggle. On the other, the social revolution. Such are the terms of the dialectical contradiction through which the socialist movement makes its way. It follows that this movement can best advance by tacking betwixt and between the two dangers by which it is constantly being threatened. One is the loss of its mass, character, the other the abandonment of its goal. One is the danger of sinking back to the condition of a sect, the other the danger of becoming a movement of bourgeois social reform. Rosa Luxemburg and Social Democracy. <clears throat> Given the stark alternative of sectarianism, or reformism that Luxembourg posed, it is little wonder that she concluded that, that social democracy was the only class movement. The fact is that social democracy is not joined to the organization of the proletariat. It is itself the proletariat. Little wonder that she found it hard to break from the German Social Democratic Party, even after the betrayal of 1914. Better the worst working class party than none at all was her initial reaction. Luxembourg has a tendency here to see social democracy as the class movement, even when she can see that it is riddled with opportunism. Her faith in the mass strike after 1904 is like an antithesis to the opportunism and capitulationist tendencies of the social democratic majority. So when talking about the party, Lenin and she are talking about two different beasts. For Lenin, the small revolutionary party fights within the class for a revolutionary consciousness, 
whilst Luxembourg looks to the spontaneous movement of the class to shake social democracy from its decline into reformism and opportunism. Thus her conclusion against Lenin, Historically, the errors committed by a truly revolutionary movement are infinitely more fruitful than the infallibility of the cleverest central committee, was really, like the whole of her pamphlet, aimed at her own party and had little to do with what Len Lenin was arguing, as he himself noted. It is, in any case, nonsense, since it is both a false dic dichotomy and seems to worship failure against success. Luxembourg had an incredible belief that new struggles in Germany would of themselves correct the course of social democracy. If, at any time and under any circumstances, Germany were to experience big political struggles, an era of tremendous economic struggle would open up at the same time, if they stood aside from the movement or opposed it. The union or party leaders would be swept away by the wave of events <clears throat> and the economic and political struggles would be fought to a conclusion without them. How they would be pushed aside, Luxembourg does not say, but she does not offer us the logical step of a split in social democracy leading to a new party. Luxembourg went further than this in her last speech to the founding Congress of the Communist Party of Germany. Having finally broken with social, social democracy only a few months earlier, Luxembourg again missed the point. Criticizing her former colleagues, she said, they think that to educate the proletarian masses in the socialist spirit means the following, to lecture them, distribute leaflets and pamphlets amongst them. But no, the socialist proletarian school does not need all this. Activity itself educates the masses. This was dangerously wrong. In the first place, the Social Democrats had no interest in revolution, so any discussion of their methods was now irrelevant. And in the second place, such stress on activity as the only educator of the working class leads, and in this case of the KPD, German Communist Party, did lead to voluntarism. <clears throat> Whilst Luxembourg herself condemned Leibniz's declaration of the Spartacus revolt of January 1919, she had partially prepared for activity like this in her view of the development of class consciousness. The debate on centralism. One of the main reasons for the differences between Lenin and Luxembourg is that Lenin was one of the first Russian Marxists created by the conditions of class struggle in Russia in the 1890s. <clears throat> Luxembourg came from Poland to join what she considered to be the greatest socialist party in the world. Her misfortune was that she was never so involved in party issues as Lenin. He was actually in at the foundation of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. He had seen what would happen to it if it did not have a clear organizational framework. Hence, he emphasizes the need for centralism. Luxembourg, on the other hand, was on friendly terms with all the reformists in, socialists, in social democracy and frequently expressed herself in private letters to people like Clara Zetkin as quite dismayed at the way the party leaders were going. But instead of developing a public critique against them, as Lenin did against people he respected and even loved, like Vera Zasulich and George Plekhanov, Luxembourg put her faith in the activity of the class correcting Kotsky's errors. And in every way, her critique of Lenin's one step forward, two steps back text is really not aimed at the Russian party at all. In fact, Lenin complained that Luxembourg does not acquaint the reader with my book, but with something else. Lenin actually rebuts every charge made by Luxembourg against him, but we will give just one example. Luxembourg had accused Lenin of following the neo-Jacobin activist August Blanke and thinking that a small elite, in this case the party central committee, could make the revolution. Lenin was forced to reply, Actually, actually, this is not so. I have not advocated any such view. Our controversy has principally been over whether the central committee and central organ should represent the trend of the majority of the party congress, 
or whether they should not. About this ultra-centralist and purely blankest demand, the comrade says not a word. She prefers to declaim against the mechanical subordination of the part to the whole, against slavish submission, blind obedience, and other such bogies. I am very grateful to Comrade Luxembourg for explaining the profound idea that slavish submission is very harmful to the party. But I should like to know, does the comrade consider it normal for supposed party central institutions to be dominated by the minority of the party congress? The mass strike. This leads us logically to the mass strike. Rosa Luxemburg actually wrote this when she was in Finland, staying with Lenin and other Bolshevik leaders in 1906. She had recently been released from a Polish prison after three months imprisonment, having been arrested for entering Poland illegally in order to take part in the 1905 revolution, which was then in action throughout the Russian Empire. As a leader of the Socialist Party of the Kingdom of Poland in Lithuania, she took part in the discussions which then led to its unification with the Bolsheviks at this time. This alone should convince This alone, this alone should convince anyone that whatever the political differences she had with the Bolsheviks, she shared their revolutionary conceptions. It was to promote her idea of revolution that she wrote the mass strike. Her target, as always, was the German Social Democratic Party, particularly the trades union leaders. Luxembourg had been trying to get the German party to adopt a resolution in favor of the mass strike before her, her imprisonment. At the Jena conference of the party in 1906, however, the best that could be agreed was that the socialists would call a mass strike <clears throat> in the event of the curtailing of voting by the Kaiser. Even this was too much for the trades union leaders, who, for the first time, openly went against social democratic policies. Luxembourg's pamphlet was aimed at convincing the party to overturn the decisions of these trades union leaders. Once again, Luxembourg's revolutionary intent was not matched by revolutionary arguments. In the first place, she misjudged the nature of trades unions by insisting that they are fighting organizations of the proletariat. In the early days of unions, when there were no permanent officials, this may have been partially true. However, unions have never been anything other than defensive organizations of the class. They were certainly not the bodies which would lead the assault on capital, and by 1904, the, the bureaucratized unions of German social democracy were four square against any proletarian revolution. From here comes the second error, where she argues that in the mass strike, the economic and the political are of equal importance. In a word, the economic struggle is the factor that advances the movement from one political focal point to another. The political struggle periodically fertilizes the ground for the economic struggle. Cause and effect exchange each second. Thus, we find the two elements, the economic and political, do not incline to separate themselves during the mass strike in Russia, not to speak of negating each other as pedantic schemes would suggest. But as with so many of our arguments, the elegance of the prose masks the weakness of the argument. It is quite true that economic struggles of the class, or more precisely, the mass moments of such struggles, raise political demands which show that the class defines itself, creates its class identity, and advances its interests, both political and economic in struggle. But the consciousness which emerges from those struggles is based on the political advances made by the proletariat and formulated by their class political organs. Sometimes the class is ahead of the party here, as in 1905 in Russia, with a Menshevik attempt to find a way of unifying strikes and strike committee led to the formation of the Petrograd Soviet. This arose spontaneously out of the struggle in 1905, but its successful re-establishment as an organ of workers' power 12 years later was because the Russian Social Democrats had learned from that experience and recognized the value of that organ for establishing workers' autonomy. 
Luxembourg, in fact, fetishizes the forms of struggle which she thinks will automatically lead to the formation of class consciousness. In this, she sometimes sounds religious. <clears throat> The most precious thing, because it is the most enduring in the sharp ebb and flow of the revolutionary wave, is the proletariat's spir spiritual growth. The advance by leaps and bounds of the proletariat affords an inviolable guarantee of its further progress in the inevitable political and economic struggles ahead. <clears throat> but this is a myth. Once the period of open class struggle is over, the consciousness of the proletariat retreats. The class is once again atomized and divided. The workers who created the Soviets in 1905 marched off to war in 1914, and when they recreated the Soviets in 1917, they still did not have an authentically proletarian content to start with. <clears throat> Given that they voted to support the provisional government, it was only with the Bolsheviks' injection of class politics into the Soviets based on the lessons of 1905 that the problem was overcome. Luxembourg, in the mass strike, consistently fails to analyze the content of the struggle, and this, in the end, appears to leave her as a worshipper of spontaneity. Or at least it would do, it would do if she did not also write such passages as the following. The Social Democrats are the most enlightened, most class-conscious vanguard of the whole proletariat. They cannot and dare not wait, in fatalist fashion, with folded arms for the advent of the revolutionary situation, to wait for that which in every spontaneous movement falls from the clouds. On the contrary, they must now, as always, hasten the development of things and endeavor to accelerate events. This they cannot do, however, by suddenly issuing the slogan for a mass strike at random and at at any odd moment. But first and foremost, by making clear to the proletariat the inevitable advent of this revolutionary period. However, this is what Luxembourg inside social democracy failed to do, and her tragedy is that she did not break with social democracy sooner. Naturally, however, we are looking back with the benefit of hindsight. Whilst the betrayal of 1914 sticks in our brains and now seems inevitable, it was a blow which shocked both Lenin and Luxembourg. There was no single event before 1914 which made it easy to split with the movement, even if small groups like the Lichst oh, fuck. Lichtstralin and the International Socialists already had done. As we noted, she considered it to be not just the organization of the workers, but the working class itself. <clears throat> Belief in spontaneity alone as the regenerator of the party was at times Luxembourg's only consolation. The best we can do is to learn from that experience. Luxembourg contemplated suicide when she heard that the SPD's parliamentary fraction had voted war credits for the Kaiser. She was arrested for opposing the war, as was Karl Liebknecht, the first MP to vote against war credits. The second was auto rule. In clandestine conditions, they formed the Spartacus League, but typically, even this was part of the of the USPD, the pacifist socialists led by Kotsky and Bernstein. Thus, even during the imperialist war, Luxembourg did not plant a banner around which revolutionaries could unambiguously rally. After the November Revolution, the SPD held the majority in the Soviets, and few workers had heard of the Spartacists. The formation of the German Communist Party took place over New Year, 1919. By the end of that January, by the end of that January, both Luxembourg and Liebknecht had died at the hands of the SPD's hired thugs. This tragedy only underlines the need to establish a revolutionary party well in advance of the spontaneous outbreak of the class. This also makes for a conclusion to the theoretical differences between Luxembourg and Lenin. Differences which, as we have shown, are more to do with their real experiences than with any difference in revolutionary temperament. Whilst Luxembourg thought the party was the class and that the spontaneous movement would make the party revolutionary, Lenin fully understood that only a minority could be, would be communist in advance of the revolution. It was necessary for this minority to fight within the spontaneous upsurge for it to become a communist revolution. 
once begun, that revolution would alter the working class on a mass scale and make it ready as an immense majority to found society anew. In our next chapter, we will look at the impact of the Ruf Russian Revolution of 1917 on the issue of class consciousness and revolutionary organization. <clears throat>